Welcome back, everybody, from uh, lunch. Hope you enjoyed your lunch. Now, uh, mentally rested. John Brooks is going to tell you uh, about lots of neat Proto stuff now and future now. Take it away. All right, thank you. So, um, first, uh, um, who am I? So, uh, John Brooks, uh, President and CTO of Blue Shift, uh, founded in 1995, lifelong programmer, worked on about 100 games, uh, mostly do low level graphics engines, optimization, uh, embedded systems, that kind of thing. Um, started on Q Plus in 79, uh, large self taught, <laughs> was with my friend and tutor um, from afar. And um, created the 2GS32 color code in 88, uh, did several games on the Apple II, and then just kept going, doing lots of other things. I uh, returned to Apple II Harvard, Harvard Development in 2015 when my son was six. Um, and the question I get is Protoss, what and why? Uh, so when I released the new Protoss, uh, it didn't make sense to a lot of people. But of course, we all know uh, Apple II is 40 now, Protoss is 34, but still there's new Apple II products. Uh, the disk archives, the peripherals, the emulators, games and software, all the cards that people are working on and talking about, um, and then new users learning and playing with Apple II, new kids doing it as well, uh, new interest in the history and legacy of the machine, and a uh, majority of the Apple II programs in use are ProDOS. Um, and of course, while it's designed the Apple II to be ultra modifiable, and so I think that's a challenge. That's my what. Um, so, uh, the state of Protoss in mid-2016, when I started uh, kind of getting back into the Apple II development environment. Um, so, as of last year, there were two versions of Protoss required if you were uh, making software. So, you either needed 12.9, which came out in 1990, and worked on all of the CPUs, all the Apple IIs, um, or 2.03 from 93, which required a CO2 which meant that it had to be a 2C and or an enhanced 2E or a GS. Uh, you needed 1.9 to boot on all Apple IIs, and 203 you needed for bug fixes and smart port and CFFAs with multiple drives and SCSI and lots of good things. So if you made a new program, you were uh, torn between which of these you want to use. Uh, anyway, so uh, a former MECC software developer, Raja Shimada, made a dual, dual boot utility as a way to try to uh, make this less painful. But then you needed two versions of ProDOS, and you needed the boot utility on your five and a quarter, and then you didn't have much space left for the thing you were actually trying to deliver. So that wasn't so good. So uh, on Usenet, we had a big discussion, and I you know, I guess I someone volunteered because I said, I think we should just fix Protoss. How hard could that be? <laughs> um, so then it was off to try to fix Protoss. So the first step was create a memory map because uh, 6502 takes more space than CO2, which is why Apple did this in the first place. Uh, they ran out of space in Protoss. So I estimated that the 6502 code would add about 200 bytes. Uh, so we should find 200 bytes and you can no longer be fractured into two different camps of Protoss. So I uh, took a system death function, which probably almost no one has ever seen. It only happens if uh, there's a bug in Protoss, so I'm sure Apple saw it when they were developing it. Uh, or it happens if there is a interrupt that there's no interrupt handler for. Again, most people don't have a lot of that going on in their applications. So a, if one of those two events happens, a little box comes up in the middle of your text screen that says system error, you know, with an app. But again, a bunch of code almost never gets used, but it gets loaded every time you run anything on your Apple II. So that's always nice. And um, so I moved that out to language card 2 so I could be 65 co 2 Protoss and make it work out with it. So uh, I did that. I replaced the CO2 code with 6502 code. I fixed the flashing period that it's having the splash screen uh, if you didn't have any column card. Uh, and I converted text to uppercase because the 2 and 2 plus, of course, didn't have any lowercase. Uh, and then it came time to be testing, and I realized that the quick program was, that was in Cross 2 was different than 1.9. It was not going to work. That's the buy program, and it was done by Alan Bird. Uh, it was very cool. It was a columns, used mouse text, uh, nice little UI, which is a lot better than type slash your path name and then type your file name, which was the alternative. So then the buy had to get fixed. Um, yeah, so this is the buy 
by problem. Um, so there were, so I did a survey of the different buy programs that are out there, and there are a ton. There's program selectors everywhere. It's kind of a fun little utility that let many people like to write. Uh, so I started trying to find the ideal replacements to solve this problem. I cheated a program selector that that would uh, work on all machines and um, also would be reasonable in the modern era of a CFFA card or a other large storage device where you could have more than 10 files you know, uh, on, your, on your drive. And what I found is that they pretty, pretty much either limit the amount of files that they would show because uh, they either have some hard-coded buffer size or they have a UI which is in columns or something where there's, you know, they can only show many files and they stop. Uh, so there was lots of undesirable behaviors in these other programs, and they were kind of hard to modify because they were just binary. Um, anyway, so yeah, the good, the good ones were 80 columns or more than 300 bytes, which is all that the space across has for the program selector that comes up when you type by for basic. Uh, and 300 bytes is painfully small. So a, um, a nice 40 column screen over here, you know, uh, not that large, 40 by 24 columns. Um, 300 hex bytes is uh, three quarters of that size. So if you type 18 lines of 40 columns, that's how big the program is. Um, so everything has to fit in there. Um, so that's not much. Um, so uh, uh, basically the answer was clean, clean sheet of paper, do a rewrite. Uh, and this is kind of the end result. It's a 40 column program, which means it will run on all the F2s, 6502 code. Uh, it supports 2,700 files uh, per directory, which basically means that it doesn't do anything with the 48K other than store the files. Uh, and um, and I don't, well, I never tested that. I really don't recommend anyone else test it either. Uh, Prodos is a linked list, so that's going to take a long time to load that directory. But uh, you know, it should work better than the alternative, uh, the alternative selectors. Um, yeah, or the 1 through 7 key, stack the slot and drive. Arrows and A through Z will set the file name. Uh, it'll display the slot and drive and prefix when you're drilling down into directories. Uh, and it will display all the files, not just the ones you can launch. So most yeah, of the yeah, other yeah. selective programs, you only saw system files or directories. And <coughs> sometimes it's hard to think of where you were in the directory structure because so much stuff is being filtered out. Um, it got squeezed into 300 bytes via many rounds of optimizing, and then I phoned a friend and asked Peter to help out, and he sent me several rounds, and he threw it back to me, and we played, uh, we played code golf for about two weeks. Uh, he would get to the end of his rope, and then I'd change direction, and then I'd get to the end of my rope, and he would pick it up again, and uh, it, was, it was quite the marathon there for a while. Um, so let me uh, show you, let me do a quick demo, just for people who haven't seen. Uh, I've seen this running. the way the old uh, bird's fly would work, it would just cycle through the drives one at a time. But in addition, you can just hit a number and say, I want to go back to slot seven, or I'd like to go back to slot five. And, uh, um, and if you put the same slot a second time, it will toggle to the second drive. So you can just toggle back and forth. Uh, so any of your seven slots, two drives per slot, kind of the way, uh, it's, you know, basically what Cross will support. It. Um, and then any of the dashes are showing system files that it will execute. Um, B or basic programs, those dashes are directories. Uh, and so you can just go in and see what you can run. And run programs or escape to back, back up. And uh, it's pretty lean, mean and fast because it's only got 18 rows of 40 column text. There's not a lot of, not a lot of uh, opportunity to go slow here, frankly. Um, so you, you do buy and you're back in it. And uh, oh, another kind of key thing, so if you want to get to, uh, say, the utilities, 
right, which is down their ways, you can just hit, uh, hit U and you're at utilities. So you don't have to scroll around for hours and if you get hundreds of files in the directory, uh, you know, the whole scrolling menu thing gets old pretty fast. So anyway, yeah, that's, um, that's kind of what Pitsy Bio is about. Um, So, um, so that was all good, um, and I was ready to start testing, and the first feedback I got was, hey, you really can't put anything in the second bank of the language card, uh, because there's lots of programs out there, many of them really need everybody they can get, and they're already using that memory. Um, and I said, well, that's fair enough. Um, so uh, I guess the solution was to find bytes. So let's optimize Prodos, uh, optimize Bitsy by some more, go to my good friend who I know can help whenever bytes need to be saved. Uh, and off we go again. Um, but ultimately, it turned out that uh, really it was just too many bytes that had to be saved. Something else had to go. And Protoss has this thing called a device control block. Um, and there are eight of them. And they record the name of the volume and the size of the volume of up to eight you know, uh, open files. So Protoss is limited to eight files open at once. And those eight files could each be on their own hard drive. And if they were, then Prodos would have to keep track of eight separate hard drive names and sizes. In practice, I don't think anyone ever does that. Uh, and it took a lot of memory to hold eight of these device control blocks. <laughs> so I cut in half. Um, so now Prodos 2.4 has four device control blocks. So you could up, open up four files at once, pulling data from four separate files willy-nilly on four different devices. Uh, the next four you open should also be on those same four devices if you ever want to open a file for some unusual reason. Um, so this has never come up uh, in practice by any users. Uh, I think it would be awfully difficult. I mean, you have to probably try hard to open eight files at once on eight different devices. Um, so in practice, so this seems like it's been a fairly uh, um, low impact modification and allows us to squeeze everything in. Uh, so that was the way to solve memory problem. Um, okay, so now that's good, but um, some people around here like to boot a lot. Uh, they, they boot disks over and over as they trace through things and who knows what else. And so uh, I thought, uh, well, in addition to writing programs, the other thing you want to do is to be able to, um, you know, basically say, oh, I'm done with this version of Prodos, let's boot DOS 3.3 or whatever. Because a quick program isn't going to help you if you're changing from one operating system to another, or to Pascal, or whatever. So, um, so there's Bitsy Boot, and I'll show you that real quick. Slot six. Here's Bitsy Boot. So, uh, unfortunately, I'm on an emulator, which is showing that I have cards and drives in every single slot. But normally, there would be periods here for any slot with no with no drive. In. Um, anyway, so you just basically pick a number one through seven, and it boots that slot for you. Um, you can also just decide you don't want to reboot, and quit, then you can go back to Protoss. Or there's this option, Open Apple Quit, um, which will take the GSOS. Uh, and that's that's kind of a cool thing. Uh, actually, maybe I'll try to demo that uh, real fast. Actually, I'm sure just about yeah, most. Um, all right, so we're going to go into GSOS, and then uh, we're going to go back, back to basic, and we're going to go boot uh, some game on DOS or ProDOS or whatever. So we'll, we'll, we'll boot a floppy. In this case, it's the system disk again, so it's not that exciting. But all right, so we're here messing around uh, in, in uh, ProDOS 8, and we're doing a Hello World, you know, or something. Um, yeah, it's going to work out well. Uh, and then um, anyway, and then we get a crash, so we have to reboot the hard drive, and then we have to reboot our floppy again. And we're doing some booting, and we decide, OK, We've done all of our 8-bit stuff we want to do. Now let's really go back to the finder and do some stuff there. So we go to Bitsy Boot and we say open up and quit. And boom, we're back in GSO, which has been dormant the whole time. Because <laughs> um, GSOS is in high memory. All DOS 3.3 and ProDOS everything out is in low memory. And so you can reboot it many times. Uh, and I find this helps my workflow quite a bit, being able to quickly toggle back and forth between GSOS and uh, ProDOS 8, because launching GSOS is a time-consuming operation. Uh, particularly on, on a real machine. So that has been a handy thing to me. Um, yeah. 
So yeah, so Bitsy Boot is tiny, 365 bytes on disk, or 365 bytes in one block on disk. Uh, you can get back to the GSO list. Um, okay, so more on Bitsy Buy. Um, now when you when you run Protoss 2.4 or 2.41, if you hold down the option key, uh, it will always set up Bitsy Buy as the quick program. Uh, normally, when Protoss 8 launches, it says, hey, have I just been launched by GSOS Finder? Because if I have, then whenever an APID app quits, we're going back to the Finder. Um, but sometimes that's not what you want. You want to stay in APID land and play, or play there for a while. So if you're holding down the, the closed Apple or option key, um, when you run Protoss, it will uh, use Bitsy Buy for the rest of that session. And you'll need to go to Bitsy Boot with the open Apple quit when you are ready to return back to the Finder. Um, this is all the stuff I kind of showed before. Um, yeah, and uh, Bitsy Buy will, uh, will directly run any system file. Any non-system file, it looks for basis.system in the root of your of the drive that contains the file you're launching. And it asks basis.system to run the file for you. Because if you're running a basic program, uh, Bitsy is not really stuck for that. Um, you need the basis.system interpreter. Um, if you're going to execute a text file with a bunch of commands, that you need basic for all that stuff. So, um, but one thing I did do is I created a uh, basis.system option. Um, and so what, so my, my vision for basis.system, or what I thought might be useful, is that this could be a, uh, a gateway when you want to launch your programs. Um, I haven't done much with this yet, uh, but it's in Protoss, and it can be used by the community if someone wants to uh, experiment. Um, so if, uh, as you know, when you, when you boot Protoss, it looks for the very first system file and runs that. Um, normally people make basis.system and they make a startup. Um, but anyway, if basis.system is your first file, that will get run. And it can tell that it got run from Bitsy Buy, and it can then just quit going back to Bitsy Buy. So on boot, you can have a very fast, hello, user, what do you want to do? Um, or you could have um, the first boot do whatever you want. Um, Run a special application, look for a key press, whatever. Um, and then also, basis.system will get called whenever a non system file is selected uh, in the menu. And so, what I thought would be useful that the Apple II is kind of missing this is the ability to map a file type and an auxiliary type to an application you would like to run. So, um, if you you know, launch an AppleWorks file, please run AppleWorks. If you know, if you select um, a Kyan Pascal source file, please launch Kyan Pascal. Whatever, right? So uh, there, there's a mechanism here where if someone gets to it, we could kind of have uh, association between file types and applications which can manage those file types. Um, anyway, so uh, Whenever you select a file that isn't a system file, Bitsy by first will look for basis.system in the root of the drive. If it finds, it will run that. If it doesn't find basis, then it runs basis. Uh, and of course, with uh, only 300 hex bytes, it was nice that there was only one letter difference, and that was the accident. Um, so what is on the 2.4 system disk? So um, I've got basis system 1.6, uh, one version, one minor version increment over 1.5, which is on 2.03. And all it does is it fixes basic so that when, it, when basic is run on an old integer <coughs> Apple II and it says, hey, I'm an AppleSoft basic on the system and there's no AppleSoft in this ROM, it used to just hang. It would just branch to itself. It was purple morning saying this isn't going to work and it would just die, kill the whole machine. Um, so 1.6 puts up the message saying not going to work and then it puts back the product so that you can do something else. Um, quit dot system is just a fast way to get into Bitsy Buy on a boot. So it springs up the menu, basically. Um, basis dot, uh, system would do that as well. Um, top of G plus, because DOS and ProDOS are the major operating systems. Different format, file formats, it's nice to be able to copy stuff back and forth. Uh, and having a reasonable UI. Uh, I was never a huge fan of Apple's uh, utilities of their Apple works nested uh, menu options to do file operations, but each their own. Uh, put AT Pro on there because getting our data off of our disks and onto modern machines for backup and usage is uh, a good thing, hopefully useful. Uh, then there's a utility I put on there called Make No P8, which is formerly intuitive. I apologize for that. But what it does is it removes that GSOS put back to the binder code, which will save two blocks about a K of memory. So if you're trying to squeeze a bunch of stuff onto a 
five and a quarter floppy, you know, have an extra K could be a helpful thing. Uh, and then there's a little read, read, uh, read me viewer to see some notes. Um, uh, let's see. Um, um, and then for the 2E, the CO2 processor, 2E or later, there's Cat Doctor from Regents ProCell, uh, Unshrink, Mr. Fixit, and Fastest. All again useful stuff uh, for, I think, you know, modern users. Uh, then there's also Mini Base, Mini Basic. Uh, this is a tiny program on one disk block, which you can put pop into the root as either basis.system or basic.system. And it does a couple interesting things. One is if you've got those big single load binary files, which won't load normally, loading at 2000, there's not enough memory for them. This will load binary files that start at 800 and go all the way to B8FF. So if you replace basic.system with this, then you have a whole disk full of massive one, you know, single load binary files. Uh, it will load them where basic.system will say out of memory and just fail, and then you normally need a separate loader. So this is kind of a way to avoid the whole separate loader. It takes one block, bits you buy is built into Protoss, Protoss can get down to you know, 34 blocks. It's, it's all, it's, so this is a way of making some pretty efficient compilation disks if people choose to. Um, it can also run large basic files. Because there is no basic.system, instead of your high man being at 9600, it's more like B, you know, B800 or something. It's much higher. So you can load bigger programs and have more variables, but it's not all basic, it doesn't have all commands. It's just an ampersand uh, micro file system. Uh, thing. Anyway, so if you run a big, big basic program, um, well, okay, so, uh, so MiniBaz, when it launches, if it doesn't see any uh, any program being passed from Bitsy by, it just quits. So on the boot, you get a menu. Um, it can't handle executing text files or launching GS OS S16 files, which basic system can handle because um, it's really tiny. Um, but um, but yeah, what it can do is that if you run a basic program and it stops or you're tired of it, you can hit ampersand and it will put it out. So that's what MiniBaz does. Um, so then there was 241. Uh, 241 was just pretty clean up and responding to some requests from the community. Um, and uh, one was adding support for some of the application compatibles, which weren't quite as compatible as the other compatibles, which worked with 2.4. Um, and so that's those there. And then also there's a couple of minor bitsy by bugs. Um, and then I also released 241 via system disk 44 for people who like Apple's um, uh, Okay, so that's pretty much it on uh, on Protoss current. So now we talk about what else could we do with Protoss beyond this. Um, so I'm, I've been working for uh, probably six months on improvements, further improvements to Protoss. Um, it's like it like to be called Protoss 2.5. I initially thought it was maybe going to be 2.4.2, but you know, pulling the thread on the sweater, more things keep coming in. I think it's kind of probably beyond the scope of a Ultra minor update. Um, but anyway, but the so for the tiny things, uh, there's still a couple bitsy by bugs uh, that affect crippled cards that I didn't have or aren't super common. So the 2E card needs a patch, um, uh, and um, actually that's this, this comment is, is for here. So uh, and then the workstation card for Apple Share on Apple Twos, um, you know, didn't work. So gotta fix those two things. Um, there's been lots of new activity in the Apple II community, so there's more utilities we can put on. There's a new ABQ Pro. Um, I should probably update Top Q Plus because we're using a pretty ancient version. I distributed it last time. It was the only one that would work on an integer Apple II. Uh, for some reason, Protoss, or Top Q Plus after 7.2 uh, stopped working on integer. Um, so if anyone wants to figure out why that is, I'd be curious. Uh, there's a new cool uh, project called DOP, or DOS on Protoss. Um, I haven't really played with it much, but just read about it on the uh, Usenet. Um, but it uh, it patches, the R it replaces the RWTS with DOS, um, so that when DOS tries to do file operations, it instead calls Protoss. And so you can have Protoss that's actually a container for DOS and run your DOS games on your Protoss device. So that would be interesting. Um, there's a bunch of Apple Share utilities from Michael Guadero. Uh, he's also the guy that found and used this. Michael's also the guy that's been doing the ROM 4X, 5X thing for the Apple 2C and 2C Plus. Um, he's, he's a big Apple Share guy, so we popped this issue, and uh, he's off fixing other 
uh, languishing Apple Share thing. So if you're an Apple Share enthusiast, um, you might want to get on using that, uh, you know, the, the CSA 2.2, um, and we can talk about improvements. Uh, and also, we'd like to release three and a half inch disk image uh, instead of just five quarters for uh, all the people with GSs out there and two C pluses. Um, okay, so uh, next change um, is increasing the number of files in the root directory. Forever and ever, we've only been able to have 51 files in the root, but everybody loves to put things in the root directory. It's the most convenient place to put things. Then we hit 51, and you know, it, all things break, and we have to figure out what we're going to do and delete. And um, anyway, so. Um, so, uh, I've got a patch for 2.4 and 2.4.1, which auto-expands the root directory size, just like a subdirectory. And if you create a subdirectory and you keep adding files, it just keeps growing. Uh, but there's an explicit check-in for the root directory, which says, once you hit 51, no more. Uh, so, they did that because the 5 and quarter uh, bootstrapping code, you know, isn't really prepared to go seeking all over the disk and loading everything under the sun. Um, so be warned that when I make this change, if you're on a five and a quarter floppy and you decide to put Protoss at the very end of a really long root directory, it may not boot. So the, 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 uh, the wise choice is put Protoss in one of the first 51 files, uh, depending on floppy disk. Uh, but anyway, the other thing is that we also don't need to have, so right now whenever you format a drive, it creates 51 files in the root directory using four blocks of disk space. Even if you're only gonna put one file, that's massive, use all the space. <clears throat> so we're basically kind of wasting three blocks to hold 51 files if you don't need more than 12. Um, so this is a way that we could free up more space on floppy disks and whatever in the future if we care to. Um, all right, next one is no slot, no slot clock. Um, never had one of these. Uh, when I had the, an Apple II, uh, I, I could have moved to the GS before I got much of the clocks. But this seems to be the way to go for a lot of the community. Uh, pretty convenient and uh, really popular, and so I'm like, well, it seems kind of a bummer to if we can get a disk having to copy clock that system or whatever, and the system onto that disk in order to have a working clock. So what do we put it into Protoss? Um, and then also the Manila gear, gear guys were like, hey, what, can't we put this on a 2 and 2 plus? Because right now it only kind of works on a 2E and 2C. And so. so I ended up making and rewriting the little clock driver, made three different configurations. Uh, one that works on the ROMs slots, or any of the, any of the uh, you know, these are have eight ROMs on the motherboard. Uh, the other one, which is kind of the conventional version the NSL system uses, where the CD or EF ROMs can be used with the NSL clock. Uh, and then I also made it work with the uh, 2C peak clock, which is actually, which looks like a slinky memory card in slot four at a specific address. So if you have a 2E with a slinky memory, you can use that thing. Anyway, uh, it's optimized to skip right over milliseconds and seconds, since about the process doesn't use that, which saves about two-thirds of the read time, so it reads a little faster. Uh, and it only installs if no other clock is found, which is pretty much just a thunder clock. So if you've got a thunder clock, it will use that instead of this, because uh, this is kind of a slow thing to read. Um, the next one is uh, expanded auxiliary memory. So um, I've got a new placement for the venerable RAM driver uh, that we know and probably don't love that much. Um, and so it will recognize up to a 16 megabytes of RAM works RAM. And it creates the normal slash RAM in AUGS bank zero because by convention, applications are supposed to look for that if they want to use AUGS memory and then disconnect it and take over AUGS memory. Uh, but then it also makes the RAM three, kind of like a RAM factor would or something else uh, for the rest of the memory in the RAM works card. Uh, and it, Makes 63 and a half K of the 64 K of each bank available for data storage. The other half K is for the driver data that has to manage the stuff. Anyway, it's um, a little faster than the other auxiliary drivers, mostly Breedon's one from ProCell, and there's uh, the fine engineering one, the RAM Factor. Uh, it's got unrolled loops for reads and writes, and um, there is a problem with auxiliary memory, which is if you want to read from auxiliary language card and write from the main language card, there's no real configuration settings will do that, so I um, I buffer through registers and flip back and forth rather than what uh, what uh, the Apple slash RAM driver does and all the other drivers do is any block that's in RAM card in the language card and they copy the whole 512 bytes, actually swap the 512 bytes with main memory, then they copy it out and then they swap it back. So it's actually a three copy slow process. Um, 
so it's a little faster, but probably not going to add it much. Uh, a couple of caveats is that the auxiliary banks must be contiguous, starting you know, at zero. Uh, some of the RAM works cards, like the three meg one, the first one and a half megs would be contiguous banks, and then there'd be like little banks scattered in there. Uh, so only the first one and a half megs would be recognized by this driver. Um, the other caveat is that the Apple slash ROM slash RAM driver used to let you say that the very first APK that you store into slash RAM will magically be placed onto double high res to be that specific half of the double high res. Uh, but they were jumping through all kinds of hoops and it was very fragile and it frankly prevented me from doing what I think will be more useful. Um, and so that was a casualty. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's that's the expanded RAM. Um, and the next one is uh, the external, uh, what I call the external hard drive driver. I've been do using this for a year or two uh, for all my development with physical machine. Um, so it connects via a serial cable, uh, 230k bytes. So it's basically Apple Talk speed. But I think it's a little faster than Apple Talk because Apple Talk wastes some bandwidth with who should I talk to and what's going on. Uh, we don't have a classroom full of machines. We've got you know, one machine and one target, and so it's a simple communication. Um, mounts to 32 meg drives from my, my PC over here, my Mac over here. Uh, the cables are about $20. It's, um, it's one of these USB to serial DB9s, and they're like $3 from Alibaba or whatever, <coughs> super cheap. And then it's this D, uh, DB9 to DIB8. It's often called a synthesizer cable. This is a 10 foot one. So you can tell it's not really a problem to have. You don't have to be super short or anything on the cables. Um, it seems to be fine to run 230 cable high. Um, anyway, so the functionality is similar to um, the serial virtual drive that Bolt made or the vir uh, virtual serial drive in the ADT. Uh, but of course, it's twice as fast, which is good. Uh, it's about twice as fast as the floppy drives, uh, and it also has been integrated with the serial ROM in the GS. So pressing reset, and which reinitializes the serial card, doesn't doesn't break the connection. So, uh, so real quick. Um, what was that last one about future ref will allow an input oh, by I Oh ready? yeah. So I, yeah, let me go back to real quick. Uh, so I've done some experimentation on this. Uh, I've manually done it so I know that it works, but um, so I, I, I can do a little bootstrapping process where um, where without any drives or anything else on the GS, you can just type in number two, and then the server will, it's, it's kind of spamming out PR number number twos all the time. So as soon as you say in number two, the PR number two gets accepted by the Apple II, and then the prompt it prints out for the very next command. And then the server can say, oh, someone's over there. I got a prop. And it can download a little a little transfer kernel, which will then send all of Protoss over 230K uh, at any rate, anyway, high speed, basically. And so we can basically net boot um, the GS without having any drives attached. Um, so. Yes, what I do at my house is you know, my son has a GS. Whenever I want to do something, I just have my floppy with with the external hard drive client on it. I just run over there and I boot that, and then I have my laptop and something. There's my 230 meg, make partitions and all my dev, 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 developer tools, and then I can unplug it and get away and can't break my stuff. So that works. Um, but uh, yeah, so I can show this real quick. Uh, so I think so we're going to need to swap videos because this has to be on a physical machine. Um, <coughs> All right, so um, I've got some little program here. Uh, it will show what drive it's accessing. So it was accessing drive one. Uh, I 
you know, I'm just going to discuss, well, well, we'll, we'll do a directory of the whole disk. I'm going to make a partition, which may get to work for a while, but I thought I was going to make it work hard. There it goes. So every little line in the border is it accessing a block. So it's, that's where it's transferring a block from the serial port. And then, uh, again, the number that's printed on the text screen is whether it's from drive 1 or drive 2. And then if it writes, there'll be W up there. And what's the server software on the other side of the serial port? Uh, it's just my own. It's like a single source file, really tiny. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that more cool. in a minute. Um, so anyway, but the other thing that's cool about this, or that I like, is um, basic. Basic thing. So we're over here. I do a lot of development emulators nowadays, and uh, so it's awfully nice to just leave my emulator open, and uh, I'll just say, and uh, so we can do that, and then over here, <coughs> the catalog. My demo, my demo uh, coolness may have just given up on me here. Oh, you can do it. Do I have the right? Uh... There it is. So. Yeah, and then I've also uh, um, had multiple emulators open, so I can have a 2D emulator, and I can have a GS emulator, and I can have a physical machine, you know, a physical GS over here, and all of them are accessing the same file system. Uh, you just don't really want to have all of them writing at the same time, that would be a bad idea. Um, but the, the server code uh, over here is just memory mapping the whole 32 uh, meg partition into memory. And so any writes by any other program on the server are all consistent with each other. There's no real, you know, out of date views of things or whatever. Um, <clears throat> it's not really a good idea to be in GSOS uh, with this stuff because GSOS caches of the directory structures, and so it may have an out of date view of the work. But let's say it's very simple. It's got real memory, so it doesn't, uh, you know, it always reloads stuff before it does much of anything. Um, all right, so that's kind of the external hard drive uh, driver. And that's uh, not out yet, correct? No, these are all parts of Q5. Right. This, this is a little bit we're doing for the last six months. Um, so let's see. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of what's going on there. Um, OK, so now we're moving beyond Cross 2.5. This is all, OK, assuming Cross 2.5 is cool and you know it's out there and people like it, uh, what else might we consider doing? Well, there's the year 2040 program uh, problem, which really hasn't been on the radar uh, so 20 plus years away. Um, anyway, the current cross time is two, is two digits, so we have 100 years, which go from 1940 to 19, uh, 2039. Um, so an idea I have, I don't know if it's the best idea, sort of open to discussing it with anyone who wants to try to fix this problem, uh, is to use the top three bits of the hour. So right now there's a byte to hold the hour, and the hour bill only goes to 24. So we're wasting three bits of the byte uh, for the hour. And so if we have to use those top three bits and extend our year, we can get a 10-bit year, or a year can go to 1,000, which would give us a range of 1940 to 2,940, um, and would give us you know, extra 900 years or so. Um, it would require changing apps to use the 10-bit year, uh, which would be a pain. Um, but the date and time remains at four bytes, and usually keeping things in the same space is a lot easier than trying to change apps to make things larger. Um, another thing we could consider doing is adding seconds and milliseconds. Uh, most of the clocks have that information. They just aren't normally stored in Protoss. So we could go ahead and read them. And even though they wouldn't be stored on the drives, uh, we could at least have them in our BF100 page. So apps could say, get the time, and a little bit and do some work, and say, get the time, and hey, how many milliseconds have elapsed? Or seconds, instead of right now, right now it's minutes, uh, which is not very, very fun. Um, yeah, so we just need to change the clock drivers in short seconds. That's probably pretty easy to do because there aren't that many clock drivers. Um, okay, another one is uh, increasing the codes. Um, so, Protoss uh, currently has basically 12K of language card, which works out to be 11K per code and most and, and some data. 
a big 1K buffer, which is equivalent of the open file buffer that you have to make with Protoss. So there's one block that has the where is data on my disk for this file, and then one other block is, you know, is, is a, a data buffer block. Anyway, and then there's also the famous 300 exabytes for, for the byte. So anyway, so ideas, um, you know, one of my kind of ulterior motives with doing that RamWorks driver is, hey, we can extra 64K, uh, that'd be a lot more memory than 12K. Uh, there's lots of stuff we could do if we have a whole extra bank. And you know the RAM works may have been hard to come by back in the day, but they're pretty affordable and pretty available nowadays. Um, so that seems like it would be a good thing. Um, and on the GS, of course, we have typically lots of memory, so or lots more memory. Uh, comes with 286, so we could uh, use one of the high banks for extra memory there. Other options is we could just swap in code segments. Uh, if someone's got a RAM factor or sync memory card, you can try to swap stuff that way. Uh, or from a hard drive. Right now, Protoss assumes that it loads once, it's all in RAM, and you can throw the disk away, and it will still work. Uh, whereas pretty much all other modern OSs, for the most part, you boot them up, and that boot drive needs to stick around. So um, anyway, so there's some options there. Um, personally, I'd like to see if we could move Protoss out of the language card altogether, because uh, I got my Apple II Plus in 79, and it was cool. We could uh, do lots of fun things with language card, and we can't do them anymore, and haven't been able to since 83 when Protoss came out. So that made, made me sad, but you know, that was the way. So um, so why would we want to move Protoss out of language card? Uh, several cool features. One is we could have an you know, integer dot system, and it's not just an Apple soft, it's a base dot system. Um, get our language, our, our WAS based back, which I'm kind of a like a school. Uh, we can also make patches. So we could fix bugs, make things faster, change Applesoft, a lot of stuff that you kind of have to hack around now. You could kind of change more flexibly. You know, interestingly, Woz had that vision. He's like, I'm putting all this stuff in ROM, but language card lets you swap it all out to RAM and do whatever you want. So I, I think it'd be pretty powerful for the community if we could re-allow people to do whatever they want instead of walk down to the ROMs that shipped when the machine was made. Um, also, there's a lot of DOS 3 games which require 64K, and they were expecting to use that upper language card. And uh, you know, Peter's uh, Kimba has been jumping through all kinds of hoops trying to rearrange those games so that we can leave Protoss up there. Um, so anyway, uh, and there would also, of course, be more more memory in that first 64K for applications to use. So it would probably be relevant for the guys trying to do MMOs and stuff, or you know, the the cloud-based RPGs, although. They're already kind of having to punch out because of this problem uh, to find other solutions. <clears throat> um, what, if, if you move it out of the language card, where would it go? So uh, like, again, uh, to one of the other RamWorks okay. banks. Got so it. two yeah. of these RamWorks banks, pick a high one. And now you have, so the other thing is you have 64K. If you have a whole 64K, we can also go to a driver model, where instead of saying everything has to be bundled in Protoss at boot, even though you're not, you may not use half those drivers, we could go hey, we started up, and here's a list of drivers we would like to use, and let's load a driver, because we have 64K, and we can make that happen. As, as, as long as we're considering putting it in other places, could it be put into low memory, so we could go into Apple III emulation mode? Um, I don't know. What do you mean by, oh, you mean down Because you're limited to 48K, oh, yeah. Apple, yeah. and yeah. Apple's uh, emulation mode well, three. Yeah, I guess so. I, I, I have to think about that. Yeah. Like early versions of Protoss would load in the lower 48K. Right. You didn't have basic system, but you had Protoss. Or, or like DOS 3.3 does, where it loads right. in the lower 48K. Right, exactly. Okay. And that would be useful for Apple 3 and for Apple 1. Is that the idea? Apple 2 Plus. Well, oh, sure. Yeah, Apple yeah. 2 Plus without a language card. All right. Well, that's with an Apple 3, you don't even have the option of a language card. Okay. So. Yeah, no, so I hadn't even considered that. That's why it's good to get these discussions going and see what we can do. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, um, all right, so the next thing. Uh, so this one would be cool. So increase the drive size. So Apple in 85 released the 2C, and they increased the size of the smart port. Smart port was one of the main things it did, is it increased the size of disks from 32 megs to 8 gigabytes. No one ever used it. And then one year later, they got the GS, and they raised it again to 2 terabytes. So all the machines are able to access three or four byte block numbers, and Protoss never used it. So Protoss 2, I believe, was, Protoss 2 was largely all about use smart port. And smart port was all about fixing limitations of the first go around, which were be able to have more than two drives per 
you know, per controller and be able to have more blocks per drive. Um, this one I think would be a big one, a big boom to the community because 32 megs is a, is a pretty small box to play in nowadays mm -hmm. with big storage cards and all Basimov and 4M creating hundreds of disks uh, at rapid intervals. So, um, yeah, so to me this would be a cool thing to do, but it's also not super trivial or easy. Um, but I'll talk about some of the issues. So as far as challenges, um, Protoss would still need to support both the standard 32 meg drive format and the large drives at the same time, I think, because you wouldn't want to convert all of your products over, all of your, your drives over to a large format and then not be able to read the floppy, which would be on the, you know, the previous format. So we have to support both. Um, of course, we only have that 11K memory, which is a problem. Um, so we'd have to make some modifications to the file entry format, because um, the, the block index goes from two bytes to four bytes. Um, and of course, applications directly read that file entry format if they want to give you a list of files to uh, select from or whatever. And uh, Prodox has no pre, pre code space, as we talked about earlier. Um, so my proposal uh, is to add three bytes to the end of each file entry. So instead of 39 bytes, which is what it's at now, and it always has been, to increase to 42 bytes, uh, which means instead of 13 file entries in every block, we would only have 12. So basically we would give up one file entry and spread those bytes out amongst the other 12 and give us three extra bytes. Um, now that would be a legal change according to the Prodos spec, because the Prodos directory format says, we will tell you how many directory entries there should be in a block, and we will tell you how large it is, and you should use that. Um, some programs use that, many do not, uh, so we can fix those. Um, so one thing I've done is with my RAM 3 driver, when it initializes the RAM 3 RAMWorks volume, it creates 42 byte directory structure. And so I've been testing that. And I figure if I release this version, or release the version of Cross 2.5 or whatever, that has a change in it, and the whole community can copy the files into the RAM 3 and run some programs and see if they work with that volume or not. And it's kind of no harm, no foul, because we aren't going to blow anyone's drive up um, or damage their, their data. Um, there's other possible ways of extending the file system. Um, so this is just you know, the first shot across the bow, um, but it might be interesting to discuss that as a community. Um, but again, that 42 byte entry allows us to get up to 4 gigabytes of uh, files. So if we want to be streaming audio or doing other interesting things, uh, you know, that would be much better than the 16 meg limit that we have now. And then two terabytes of drive, which would hold a whole lot of really old 40 year old software. Um, and <coughs> interesting, so this design, uh, I haven't moved any of the fields around that, that, that access. I just added three bytes to the bottom. And then there were a number of fields that had housekeeping, housekeeping information that Protoss used. And I've taken those housekeeping things and I've aggregated pair it together, I've moved them down to the end. I kind of did some <laughs> shuffle rearranging, but all that housekeeping would be done inside of Protoss and it shouldn't really affect the application. So I don't think there'd actually be much changing we'd have to do. It's mostly just change, telling the apps that each directory entry is 42 bytes instead of 39 and only 12 in a block instead of 13. But I haven't looked at that at all. Again, it's a place where I would welcome the contributions if people want to help. Um, so yeah, then once we can tell that apps are okay with the 42 byte size, then we can do the more the heavy lifting thing, which is to actually go do that rearrangement like I was talking about, like moving over to a four byte uh, block count and changing the next previous pointers to be four bytes and letting the byte count and file count uh, go to four bytes and add the uh, larger in the file, which is the four gig file size. Um, and then the real magic here is in changing the way Protoss manages uh, files, which is used in extensive based system. So extensive is something you'll see in Linux a lot. There is ext2, 3, and 4 file systems. Um, and what extends me is instead of saying, uh, I'm going to tell you where every block is on the disk, which is what Protoss did in 1982. Instead it says, I'm going to tell you where the first you know, block is on the disk, and I'm going to tell you, use the next 100 blocks. It's basically, it's, 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 a, it's a range uh, specification instead of a one by one specification. And uh, anyway, using a range system, we could, uh, you know, manage to shoehorn into Protoss's memory and existing file structure, uh, I think. But again, anyone who really wants to talk about that, you can be careful if I haven't put you to sleep. 
or whatever, um, by me. Uh, and then the other issue is that there are some robots with commands which will need to have an extended form, most notably read, block, and write block. You know, if we're going to have four bytes of a block number, then having an API, you know, an ML, MLI call, which only gets past two bytes, that's not going to apply. So uh, the extension idea I'm thinking of is to, when we make a protocol call, you have a little parameter list. And the sanity check that you're not giving garbage, there's a count, the count byte at the start of that parameter list. I'm um, thinking that if we set that high bit on the parameter list, that will flag that we have an extended call here, and the application knows that it wants to meet a block number or write the block number that is much bigger than we've ever had before. All right, so, um, so next steps. So Protoss 2.5, uh, I just need to test the no-slot talk and RAM 3 drivers on lots of apples and configurations. Um, then port my external hard drive server uh, two other machines besides my Mac, unless all people only want the Mac. Um, but I figured the Raspberry Pi would be a nice place to put it among other, other places. Um, there's some um, external hard drive improvements, like the Netboot thing I talked about. Um, I think it would be really cool. Uh, so I don't have to carry a floppy with me whenever I go to my, my son's uh, machine. Um, and then uh, gathering up all the latest utilities and the package and all that time consuming stuff. Documentation, all time consuming. Uh, and help with testing or docs or coding would be great. So anyone who uh, is looking for a project or uh, would like to help out, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is not a small scale endeavor. It seems to be getting bigger on me. I keep thinking I'm just gonna do this thing and I'll be done and the done part isn't happening. So, uh. All right, uh, so what about this future stuff, which is all these cool ideas, how do we get there? Um, so I'm thinking the first step is to just test with the uh, 42 byte directory format, which again, Protoss apps are supposed to abide by, but I'm pretty certain that they don't in the little testing I've already done. Um, and then, you know, let's get a more comprehensive list of which apps work and which apps break, and uh, how hard it is going to be to fix the ones that are broken. Um, so that's something we can do right now. And then just kind of talk about all these crazy ideas. Uh, what do people care about? Uh, who wants to help? Uh, you know, could this get done in our lifetimes? You know, what, what's the deal here? Uh, and just a general uh, call for contributors, again, anyone who wants to help. Uh, the scope seems to be well beyond my one-man hobby time uh, now, uh, so uh, help, help would be helpful. Um, yeah, so Summer Cross 2.5 is coming soon. Uh, I thought it was going to be here for Kansas Fest, but uh, I was wrong. And um, so my current target is later this year, maybe the fall, maybe <coughs> the holidays, I don't know. Uh, we'll see, hopefully, hopefully soon. Um, Apple II has been amazing for 40 years, uh, but WAS allows us to keep making Apple II better. Uh, we can't change the chips, but the software can evolve, and uh, so let's evolve it. Uh, and many hands make life work. At least that's what my parents always told me when I had to do the chores. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's all I have. Uh, questions? Uh, would it be possible to either integrate or uh, provide a driver for mounting disk images in Protoss 8 like you can with mount it in uh, GSOS? Yes, uh, yeah, I, I thought about that too, but it was really good the slides. Yeah, I think that would be super useful to right. be able to yeah. mount more of a modern image-based paradigm yeah. instead of having to do the contents of ADP and whatever. Yeah, for sure. So, well, particularly, well, it's a, it's a code space problem again, right? If, if, we can, if we can find a way to get out of this code space jail that we've been stuck in, uh, then I think a lot of things want. open here. Right? Yeah. Yes. Wasn't, wasn't there some problem with the, you know, the no slot clock or the Protoss where you had to reset the year every seven years or something like that? Does that fix this? I don't know. So I can, I've, I've never looked at a no slot clock guy. The problem with that is that it, uh, it, it only has a range of, of seven years, and you actually have to patch the driver to tell it what year you were in. And Apple even did that in subsequent releases yeah, of the Protoss. They yeah, actually the Thunder Talk is that way. Yeah, and, and in fact, um, like when you install a two server from the Linux command line, it will actually look at the current date and go ahead and patch the Protoss that gets installed in real time. Okay. So, but that just might be a, an artifact of the existing. Protoss clock mechanism, and if you're replacing that, then maybe it could just be smart. Okay, oh yeah, testing helps to be as I think. Yeah. yeah, in the back. Yeah, that was my understanding that the no slot clock drivers out there were patching the thunder clock mechanism, and because the no slot clock itself can store, I think, a century or something, 
Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't see any patch mechanism in any of the Nelson Pop drivers I looked at, but it certainly is in the Thunder Pop drivers. If um, we want to make a bootable 241 disk and to distribute something we've built, is there anything in your distribution that you should keep on that disk, or do we just need Protoss in our own system files? Yep. Yeah, and if it's going to be for distribution, I recommend you run the no the the make no 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 PA option because you won't need the GSO as quick machinery. So it'll save you okay right there. Yes. Um, how do your Protoss extensions to the file system affect the PA for uh, launching programs on the GS? Um, well, so we would also yeah, this is a question. We would also want to modify the Protoss FST part of GS and either release just that FST or release a whole new update of GSOS probably. Um, so that uh, GSOS would be able to access the extended file format um, that Protoss 8 was using. Uh, but that should be really easy because the GS has so much more memory and system code and stuff. I, I wouldn't, that, that should be a, a pretty straightforward engineering effort. Yes. Okay. DOS on Protoss, is that something that's going to be in 2.5 or is that something similar to DOS Master? Or? Um, well, it's something that the community did. I read about it on the CSA 2. I uh, haven't actually tried it, uh, but it looked really cool. It got a lot of interest, and I thought it might be appropriate to include in a future OS release so it was more easily accessible to the community. Uh, but yeah, if someone wants to look at that and see how compared to the other versions and you know pros and cons, that would probably be a good idea. I'm not sure how much feedback the author has had. Um, but uh, just being able to get DOS on Protoss seems like it would be a value if we can find a good way to do it. Um, in terms of how you did this, like, did you did you disassemble the binary? Do you have access to the source somehow? Did you, how did you do it? Yeah, so, the, um, so in 2015 when I got back into the scene, I found Mac Gooey, and Mac Gooey <coughs> had a whole bunch of source, the firm, GS firmware and GS OS and all kinds of things. So I just pulled stuff down, uh, you know, after 20 years, I'm like, oh, there's still, G there's still an Apple II thing, and look at all the stuff people have made and put up and whatever. So. Um, yeah, so the hard part was really recreating uh, the build environment that Apple used because they were not using the Apple II, they were using the Macintosh. Um, but luckily, after I did Rastan, I spent the next five years doing Super Nintendo games on the Macintosh using MW. So I was very familiar with that whole system, and, and I used the 2GS tools um, for all that Super Nintendo work. And so I knew how to set up MW, and how to set up the tools, and how to set up the memory partitions, so the thing where you crash and run out of memory, and the, the fragile little nature of this of Mac system, and all the rest of that stuff. So I was able to kind of set stuff up and get it to work so that I could rebuild from the source, uh, kind of the Apple way. I think we have time for one more. Actually, is that a question that's an issue for you? Mm -hmm. When the time was right, and I think the time was right, you're talking about being able to fix Copy 2 Plus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the source code. Ah, that would be so helpful. Look for that later this weekend somewhere and get announced and released. Ah. It's 8.4, so it builds the last good version of 8. Cool. All right. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.